I now recognize Mr. Griffith for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I believe we should have reasonable travel restrictions. Dr. Frieden, in answering a question of my colleague from Colorado, Mr. Gardner, you indicated that Nigeria didn't have any restrictions, and that is accurate. But I have in my possession, I'd ask that it be submitted uh, to the Committee for the Record, a letter from uh, Delegate uh, Robert G. Marshall of Manassas, Virginia, to Governor Terry McAuliffe, uh, Governor of the Commonwealth. And in that, he cites the International SOS, a prominent medical and travel security services company with more than 700 locations in 76 country, countries, reports that African countries have imposed total air, land and water travel bans by persons from countries where Ebola is present. The countries include Kenya, Cape Verde, Cameroon, Mauritius, South Sudan, Namibia, uh, Gambia, Gabon, Cote d'Ivory, Rwanda, Senegal, Chad, and Kenya. South African Development Community members, 14 countries, only allows highly restricted entry from Ebola-affected regions with monitoring for 21 days and travel to public gatherings discouraged. I find that interesting, Dr. Frieden, because some of those countries have had previous outbreaks of Ebola themselves. Wouldn't you agree that, they have, that some of those countries have had to face Ebola before? I would have to check the list carefully to know, but I will take your word for it. All right. Um, I, I will tell you that this is a concern to a lot of our constituents and to mine as well. And I was checking my Facebook page recently when I saw that a Facebook friend of mine, a father from Virginia, asked for prayers for his daughter because she lives in the apartment complex with the first nurse, nurse number one, as I think somebody referred to her earlier, uh, and was very concerned. And while I think I know the answer, I would like to get your answer so that I can reassure this father, and that is, his question is, if I count to 21 days and my daughter is not infected, at that point can I exhale and breathe a sigh of relief? Not only uh, can he do that, but he can do that now because uh, the first nurse only exposed one person, one contact, and that was only in the very early stages of her illness. So at and most, I, one person from the community was exposed. And I appreciate that. He also asked a second question. He said there's some suggestion coming out of Dallas that the patient's dog may be infected and may have infected other dogs through actual contact or by feces. Can the virus be transmitted by dogs? And I will tell you that I, I did some homework on this because I thought it was an interesting question and found a CDC publication from March of 2005 that uh, did a study on dogs in Africa in the affected areas and a study in France to, to, as a control group. And they found that while dogs show antibodies for Ebola, uh, they don't, they're asymptomatic. But the, but the study went further to say that there's really a lot of questions about how Ebola is transmitted. And in some instances, uh, Gabon in 96 and 2004, Republic of Congo likewise, 2004 in the Sudan, that there is a question mark as to whether or not or how that Ebola outbreak occurred. It wasn't in the normal or standard ways. It wasn't human to human. And there this report indicates that dogs might be, might be, I don't want to scare folks, might be suspect. I guess my question to you is, isn't it true that we really don't know a whole lot about the various outbreaks of Ebola? And so when we're trying to assure the American people, just like previously we didn't think it would come to this country and then we thought uh, if it did get to this country we wouldn't have any, any problems controlling it, now we've got all kinds of people being monitored. Isn't it true there are still a lot of questions about how Ebola is spread? Although we're still learning a lot about Ebola and every other organism that we study and that we control, we have a lot of information about Ebola. We have a good sense of how it's controlled. And um, we've looked at the issue of exposure to animals. We know that in parts of Africa, consumption of uh, forest living animals can be a cause. We don't know of any documented transmission from dogs to humans, but that's why the authorities, with our agreement, have quarantined and the dog, and we will be sure. helping them to assess that situation. And it's, it's also true that while we have no evidence of transmission from human to dogs, we really don't know if there can be. We have uh, what we call in the law, I used to be a lawyer, uh, you have a lack of evidence as opposed to negative evidence. We don't have clear evidence that you can't transmit it either. And what's interesting is that raised the question for me about, okay, we've got no restrictions on travel of human beings. How about the dogs? I called Customs. They said, well, our experts are there. And then after pushing them a little bit, they said, that's USDA. We call USDA. And Dr. Frieden, they said, uh, that would be CDC. So I understand all of your reasons. While I don't agree with them completely, I understand the concerns about humanitarianism, et cetera. But 
don't you think we ought to at least restrict travel to dogs? Um, we'll follow up in terms of what's possible and indicated. Okay. Now I recognize Mr. Yarmouth for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And before I begin my questioning, I'd like to submit for the record an article entitled, Will America's Fra